Welcome in. We are starting the TNT Talks. This is going to be a show about... Uh-oh. Oh, that was Craig. <laughs> welcome in, Craig. And welcome in, Kipo and Satoros. These are our co-hosts for this week. Um, if you guys want to introduce, introduce yourselves real quick. Sure. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Super happy to be here and be a part of the first TNT Talks. Really looking forward to getting into the discussions today. And um, yeah, I'm hype. And hey, Satoris? Everybody. Yeah, it's Satoris here. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be part of this and uh, just have uh, some nice chats about what's going on in TNT and some strategy stuff. And uh, yeah, it should be a good time. Awesome. So um, I have a little bit of an intro for the show itself, but I think I'm just going to move right into talking about the format of the show. We've got a couple of things we're going to do. Um, hopefully this is going to be a weekly show. Uh, I'm going to try that out for a bit and see if we can come up with all the content for it. And we're going to have uh, news each week. We'll cover things like current, current tournaments, uh, upcoming tournaments, um, other stuff that you'll see today, and then we've got specific topics we're going to cover each week. Today's topic is 2v2 strategy, and uh, we've got some news from Illuminatus about a patch coming up, so you guys are going to want to stick around for that. So, starting right away with, uh, in the weekly news, the biggest tournament going on right now is the Dual Championship, um, and we are just about finished with Phase 2 in that, so let me pull up the bracket real quick. There we go. So the tournament is divided into two divisions. So in the upper division, uh, we've got six teams moving on to the finals, and those are all ironed out. And so we're going to have a finals phase. Uh, who is playing who? We're going to work out by tomorrow evening, me and Lupus. But for right now, we've got Meek and Night Slayer. We've got Satoros and Leon. We've got Heartseed Marmu. We've got Premium Bow Mishi. We've got Snake Night Slayer, so Night Slayer's in there twice, and we've got Shenshin Goris. Those are our six teams um, in the upper division. And I just want to ask the co-hosts here, who uh, who are you guys going to watch out for specifically in that list? Well, do you have do you have it up on stream? I'm sorry. Um, I can pull it up here on stream. Let me. Well, while, while you're doing that, uh, ah, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, there's there's obviously several very good teams here. Um, I would say I, I'm particularly interested to see how Premium Bo and Mishi uh, end up doing uh, as they go along, because I know they aren't as involved in some of the other events that we've done, you know, the last six months, year, that kind of thing, at least from what I've seen. But they're both longtime players. They're both definitely very skilled. And the biggest thing is when I've watched their games so far, they definitely seem to have a different approach to 2v2s than most of the other teams. So I'm really interested to see what they come up with. Um, yeah. But besides that, I mean, Meek and Night Slayer has got to be the team to beat. Uh, both of them are extremely good premier players. They have definitely shown us uh, that they can beat definitely not only beat everyone but consistently be the best team at least i've seen so far so sure they should go far let me clarify to the viewers here i've got this pull up uh premium bomishi versus this guy in kaiseris um we haven't updated this file yet but they just played on kipo's stream so you haven't seen it go check out the vod premium bomishi won three to two over uh kaiser guy and it was a pretty close match uh kipo do you want to say anything about that that match was a lot of fun. I highly recommend checking it out. And you could see what Satoros is saying. You know, Premium Bow and Mishi, they're not aggressive. They, they almost never go for any kind of rush or one base all in. Mishi is such a macro oriented player. They like to take it to the mid game. They like to get out, uh, you know, nice, healthy armies. And the strategies that they brought to the table in that series were were really cool. I mean, Premium Bow playing like three defenses in his deck and, and Lizards as his only tier one. So definitely a unique approach to the game. You know, I was thinking about it earlier, Premium Bow and Mishi versus Meek and Night Slayer. And I agree with you, Satoros. I give Meek and Night Slayer just the slightest edge. 
the reason being that Meek and Night Slayer, I feel like they're so up to date on the current meta of this game. They're on ladder like every single day. They're in they're in the premier championship. They they both played extremely well. So, you know, mechanically and, and when it comes to like your game sense and your understanding of the game, they're they're while they're maybe even there, I think that Meek and Night Slayer might just have a little extra edge in their understanding of the, the specific metagame on this patch. Uh, and it's the Toros, bro. I gotta give you a shout out, man. You're in this too, you and Leon. So I'm looking forward to your games as well. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> we definitely have a shot. It might be an uphill battle, depending on who we get uh, put against. But hey, we had a good series with Meek and Night Slayer, so it definitely says anything's possible. So stay Absolutely. tuned for tomorrow night. We've got we've got uh, plans to get the bracket all worked out and see who is going to be facing who. So stay tuned for that. Uh, in the lower division here, we've got uh, five of the six slots already filled out. We've just got one game left to play, um, and we'll be monitoring that and seeing. Uh, we might we might be calling a tie on that one, and, and well, stay tuned. But so far, we've otherwise got Shen She and Paolan. We've got uh, GEG standing for I think it's Gorgeous Erotic Gorillas or something like that. <laughs> it's Tatanka and Cactus. We've got Sataras and Goris. We've got Sassy Marquis and Ben Dove. We've got Leon and Cactus. So Leon's in here twice. He's up here with uh, Sataros and here with Cactus. Uh, and then between Sassicosity and the Tatankas, they're uh, going to be fighting for the last spot here. I think Cactus is in here as well twice. Yep, yeah, he's in Cactus Ball and GEG. So let me ask about the predictions for these. Uh, I'll just start by saying I'm absolutely terrified of GEG. These, I mean, look at me. I got 3-0'd by them, me and Lupus. But they're just playing really well. Um, it feels like it was a mistake to have them in lower division. Um, but, you know, in the in the group round beforehand, not everyone had figured out exactly what was going on. But these guys are terrifying. Yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to agree. I mean... I, well, I was shocked when I saw Tatanka in the lower division. Like, like, he's arguably the best player in Tooth and Tail right now. I mean, we'll we'll get into the to the ladder rankings and some other things later. But I would say he's just like how Mishi and excuse me, Night Slayer and uh, Meek are the favorites in the upper. I'd have to go with Tatanka and Cactus in the lower. Yeah, I I don't think it's as it's as clear cut not that it's completely clear cut in the upper division either but i i don't know i can definitely see basically any of the teams left could definitely have a good push in the, in the bracket um i think both cactus teams are actually going to be pretty scary um i mean obviously to tank a excellent 1v1 player but leon leon is uh, has been getting better and better and he has definitely shown that he is very adept at 2v2 so um, him with Cactus, who is just all around solid, definitely can be a scary team. Yeah, oh. Le Leon Loki, a super scary player. He's one of the only players consistently pushing out uh, Falcon and Wolf, uh, and it, he's been pretty successful with it. So, yeah, I'm interested in watching his games in both lower and upper. Yeah, and I just want to say to uh, corroborate Leon's a scary player, I had to face him in the uh, beginner finals of the championship. And he he crushed me, and I think he's been continuing to improve since then. So definitely deep into intermediate territory. Uh, we've got a comment from the gentleman here in the chat. He says, 1v1 skill doesn't translate into 2v2 skill, though. Uh, an honorable mention here to the gentleman. Uh, he was in the upper division here, he and Chi Min, who I'm not familiar with. Um, but they were unfortunately knocked out. And that's kind of proving that point. The gentleman is, is one of the top players in the world in 1v1. Um, but that didn't quite translate into the 2v2 for him this time. Yeah, just just to expand on that, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons we see Tatanka in the lower division, both the teams. Sure. Like, it, it can't just be... If you added up the 1v1 skill of Tatanka and Cactus, it would be more than some of the upper division teams, but that's not what happened. Yep. Um, again, I don't remember exactly what the groups were before, but there's definitely an element to different strategy in 2v2 but also just team play how well do you get along with your teammates like yeah 
I mean, teams like uh, Zen and Palan, yeah, they're in the lower division, but like, you watch their games and like, they their coordination is incredible. And sure. I mean, that's definitely the the case with some of the upper teams too. Yeah. All right. And before we get too far too far, too much further into that, uh, we've got some more two v two strategy stuff coming up later, uh, in this show. So moving on here, uh, we've got some replay highlights from the two v two championship. Uh, Kipo, if you want to talk about these real quick, the first one we've got, I believe, is. Oh, where did I put that? There we go. First one between Marmeed and Premium Mishi. Uh, right there. So we'll just place, I think it's about 45 seconds. Yeah. Let's go for an attack now. Ooh, the commander goes down for Marmu. That's not going to be good. They're going to go for the mill. Luckily, there's no farms on it. They haven't played too greedy. They're clearing up some of this wire. They're going to poke in with the skunks. Muting. The balloon's starting to get some hot shots off. Oh, and it's a base trade. Marmu and Heartseed realize they probably can't win this engage straight up. They are going to go for a base trade where they're going to split. Here. Excuse me, it looks like Heartseed's turning around and Marmu's going for the base trade alone. Heartseed definitely shouldn't be able to... Oh, wait a second. Marmu actually takes out Premium Bow. Very well played, that. Marmu with his lizards. Can he take the That game? moment right there. No, it doesn't look like it, but now it's a two-on-one. That was such an intelligent play. And that's going to be the game. Yeah, that was... Uh... I, I love that play and I love that game just because, you know, you have to watch the beginning of it. But Marmu and Heartseed, they had an inferior army. A lot, like, they didn't have the tier 2 complexity that their opponents had. Um, so, it was a two second call. They went in, they're like, okay, we're not winning this fight, right? They go for the base trade, but then what I really like is the play by Heartseed. Because he decides to double back and take the two on one which isn't something that you see very often. You usually see a, a whole, you know, a 100% committal to a base trade, right? So so Heartseed's decision to double back and Marmu's decision to go in with the Lizards and just target that mill to take out, you know, uh, his opponent as quickly as he could, I just thought that was really cool. Yeah, so right here in this moment, we've got, uh, sorry, through the uh, pause screen, there's a fight going on here, the 2v1, and then on the minimap, you can see Marmu in the green is way up in Premium Bow's base. While this fight is going on, just kind of delaying, boom. It just finishes him right off. So, yeah, that's a... Crazy moments like that don't happen super often, but when they do, that's... That's the kind of thing we're going to show on this show. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to dive into the strategy bit too much, but, you know... It's so powerful in this game. The mechanic is such that if your base dies, then your whole entire army dies. <laughs> and you can't play the game anymore. So you could swing fights like crazy, like you saw here. Yeah. All right. And I think both of these uh, both of these teams are now in the, uh, in the finals, as we mentioned. So there is a potential for them to meet again. Yep. That would be a treat. All right. Another uh, highlight here. Meek Slayer versus Kalaru Seed. Oh, right, Marmeed. Right, no, 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 no. Marmeed and Kalaru Seed, not the same person. Premium Bo in the chat saying that he told me they were going for the base race, but he didn't think Mishi heard him. <laughs> oh, that sucks. Yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah. I was moving on here. We've got the next one between Meek Slayer and Kalaru and Heartseed. Meek Slayer here we, we're calling out as one of the strongest teams so let's see what we've got here to basically scout past you and get a little ways ahead so that they don't hear the uh the trigger of the mill and then you grab it and then you have this advantage so these pigs are going to be a little further back right oh it didn't work out that well because the pig got the got the hit on the mg it's interesting that okay now he's going to lock the pigs so so meek locks the pigs into position Oh wow! So standing far back, and they're attacking the commander. And really? When the MGs come up. They're not going to hit the pigs right away. But when the pig rotates, that's when the pig's going to go down. Right? It's a pretty delicate strategy, and, and you know you can see here today exactly how Meek executes it. Um, so right, he's going to take those. Okay, I'm going to pause here. I think that was the uh, the point of that replay there. I have not seen that happen. 
commander locking pigs is usually done when you want to lock the pig away from its the rest of its uh, base to snipe it with lizards. But Meek locked the pigs away from his turret so the turrets could go up. Is that right? Yeah. It. I. I yeah. I have <laughs> ra- I've never raged as hard as I have at Tooth and Tail, as I have when Meek has used his strategy on me. And he's used it so many times on the ladder, and you see him here now bringing it to the 2v2 tournament. I haven't seen another player do this, honestly. I really haven't, and this is why I gotta hand it to Meek, because he really thinks outside the box, and he's so creative. Uh, Sat, have you had experiences with this specific type of rush before? Oh yeah. Yeah, oh I've, definitely, I've definitely I've uh, definitely seen Meek do it and had Meek try it against me. And this is one of the reasons why I think Meek is such a good player. He will he will try literally anything. <laughs> anything he thinks that he could figure out a way to get an advantage from it, he will try. Um, and this is not easy to pull off. Uh, and in fact, it just doesn't always work. But man, yeah, he, he it's really scary when it does. It, it's stuff like this that makes me... Uh glad that i play rts because rts games the longer they're around you know years after they've been released people will find new things like this uh, it's true with starcraft it's been around for 20 years starcraft 2 for 10 years you know people just keep finding new weird things like this like he's locking those pigs away from the t- turrets i've honestly never seen it maybe it's because i don't hit meek on the ladder <laughs> you're lucky <laughs> yeah <laughs> This, this strategy is is so deadly and it's so rage inducing like four farm double me you know any kind of rush but if you get me on this one man i'm gonna like throw my controller at the screen I, I, I'm <laughs> you. all right we've got another uh cut from this video here same match 320. this was an epic game by the way this was on your stream i believe right yeah all right, here we go. Oh, I muted it. Let's bring that right back here. This place in terms of eco right now, but it looks like they're going to be able to take out Heartseed here. And I think this is probably going to be the end of the game off of some bad map RNG, right? Because, well, no, actually they, they hold it off and they throw their armies away. Wow, so they only ended up getting, is it two farms? Yeah, I believe they only got two farms out of that. Counter push. So luckily, they saved the mill in the nick of time. Unfortunately, the counter the counter harass is going to be difficult with all this wire. Hartseed thinks about going in. No, he backs up. Clar goes in from the side. Everyone's kind of disconnected here, but thankfully, Hartseed does have those toads. However, they're going for the mill, and if Meek can get this mill, he goes back then for Hartseed's it. army is going to get deleted, and it looks like it is. But is Meek going to go down as well? There goes Heartseed sent to the kitchens, and Meek oh my survives. God. He just... Two low health mills in the same game. Meek deleted the army that was attacking his mill. What is going on with that, Kipo? That was so close. That was on a knife's edge. I mean, it <laughs> literally another two seconds, and Meek's mill goes down, and it's a one-on-one. And oh. if we would have had a, a, like a straight-up one-on-one, both players on eight farms, just regular tooth and tail game it would have been the most insane 2v2 game in history but it, it was just so close and you could see you know this is also a common theme in real-time strategy if i can get a structure down really low i'm keeping in the back of my mind i could go back at any time within the next 30 seconds in this game and knock it down and that's exactly the what meek was thinking when he went in and i talked to him and night slayer after this game i actually did a post-game interview and Meek said to Night Slayer, bro, as long as I don't die, I'm going to go back and take this mill and we're going to take this game. That's so yeah. that's so incredible. Sotaros, what do you what do you think when you see that? I mean, I, I can I can count the number of games where I've seen a team try to take down a mill and fail and they still won later. Uh, and it's this game. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just it's just crazy. Would you lose that much army? for them to make that comeback and it's because meek thought hey it can somehow get around their armies and get back there and finish it then they can they can even it out and that's that's exactly what happened all right so moving on here we've got more of meek slayer this is gonna be the uh the clip worthy team maybe 
this is Meek Slayer versus Satoros and Leon, so we might get a inside <laughs> inside view on the uh, mind of the defenders here. I think I think uh, Meek Slayer won this one. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, we're gonna find out for folks in the chat that have yet to see it. This oh, was right. also a really crazy game. All right, here we go. Satoros has the right idea going a four farm double. The moles are out. Let's see if they can deflect this mole rush. They're going right for Satoros' base. I don't know this is going to work. I'm going to be honest. I really don't know that this is going to work. They have lizards on the table. They're going to be able to push this back. Oh, my God. That feels so good. I'm rooting for Satoros and uh, Leon so hard right now. They're putting up the MGs, but are they going to be fast enough? Are they? Let's see. Okay, they get an MG and they get a pig and they're out. Oh, my God. Okay, that's actually uh, the time we had on that little clip there. I love the uh, the turret follow-up from the Mole Rush. I think that's one of the best ways of doing it. But this is kind of the hot topic in the community right now. The, the Mole Rush is, is one of the most, like, tilting and extreme rushes you can do. It's the essence of cheese, you could say. Because the, mole the moles will straight up kill your base, and it's a 2v1. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's obviously very dangerous because it can immediately end the game, but there are definitely ways to hold it off. And again, I think we'll get into that later when we talk about strategy. Sure thing. I asked, I asked Meek and Knight Slayer. I was looking at their deck. I said, why do you guys both pick MG? You know, I don't see any other teams where both both players are picking MG, and they said this is the exact reason. Basically, it's to defend against counterattacks like this, so that you know you can get those MGs up quick, and, and it just gives you such a tempo advantage when it comes to uh, these engagements. But um, yeah, I was I was happy to see the mole rush get shut down personally. Yeah, yeah, it always feels good. To, uh, it always feels good when such an enraging strategy is actually held. <laughs> Bear, bear in mind, we're gonna we're gonna fast forward a bit while you're while you're searching for the next cue point. So moving forward into the game, uh, this gives Satoros and Leon uh, a pretty big tempo advantage. They're they're ahead in the eco as they go into their mid game. Right. Okay. So we're moving on to a later game here in the series between these two players. Wow, Meek is going for a, to try to knock down a mill with just moles. This is something, something that Meek is really I just want to say real quick, this is something I don't see very often. We usually see the mole rush just at that one critical point at the beginning of the game, not later on. Uh, so just bear that in mind. Known for, right? To pull this off on a 2v2, I haven't seen someone do this before. You know, Meek is, he really thinks outside the box and he does strategies that I don't see any other player do. Look at this play by Meek. Oh my god, I am so impressed right now. He's going to get that mill. He's going to go for another. If me can get two mills, like, wow. I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah, so <laughs> at the end of the day, did me get value there? It's hard to say. You know, if he had just gotten that one mill and then sold all. I think that's the uh, clip there. Yeah, so what do you think? Was that value? That was a lot of moles that he lost for a mill with four farms on it. Thoros, what were you thinking when uh, when you were playing when you were a player in this experience? I mean, it's definitely it definitely hurts. Like even <laughs> even if it's not value, it just hurts, right? <laughs> like having yeah, you know, so much of the game is controlling the map and you know making sure your front is defended and all your angles are covered. When the enemy commander can just walk to the back of your base where you don't have vision and just build an army and kill your stuff, obviously that's you know. That's annoying. Um, as far as if that was actually value, I think that was like five mole warrens or something. And it, again, it killed a mill with four farms on it. And the farms, yeah, I mean, it probably it probably was still value, but it's pretty close. It, like in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's like uh, necessarily a game winning play in that instance where like most all the moles were cleaned up and it was just that amount of damage um but they again they had a lot of defenses so it's not like we could turn around and just do a big push so um, what yeah. what did leon say like what what was the what were the comps like at this <laughs> time i i won't repeat it <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know even if uh even if it did not get value or anything and uh 
you know, it, it may not have been monetarily value or anything. It at the very least it pulls back. Uh, like Leon had to go back with his his wolf buff falcons and all that. So it's a tempo move. Um, and like you were saying, just the fact that you can appear out of nowhere like that is a mental blow as well. So it's interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. And I think in this particular game, because they were building defenses so heavily, I think it act it was a good move, because. Our, you know, the best response we can do against a wall of MGs and balloons is just get a whole crap ton of eco and then just try to, you know, win via eco and, you know, tier three and stuff like that. Right, right. Makes sense. Absolutely. So we've just got... Yeah, I, uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to show that clip, by the way, is because last patch, that was common. Like, like that wouldn't have been, at, you know what I mean? Yeah. That wouldn't have been that uncommon to see, but... This patch, it's like I haven't seen a play like that in months, so I was really happy to see it. Right, and it's because it's so questionable value-wise. But all right, uh, got a couple more here from later in the series. He has painted this. Oh, area this is the same game. Map. Later, the same game. So much static defense. I really don't see this ever being broken, and they do have an owl too. Meek and Nice Slayer are now in the corner of the map. This is where they're going to play the rest of their game. They're going to defend. Notice how Meek has a starvation farm. He's thinking about the late game. Okay, so that was the uh, that was the clip for you, Keepa. The next one is only in 40 seconds, so I might just play it through. But what was the uh, the moment there? I, I really wanted to show... This has just been one continuous game from a failed mole rush to failed mole harass. And, and what I thought was interesting here was that it's, it, like I said, they, they just own two mills. They, they have one little corner, one little sliver of the map, and they're just like, we're just going to defend for the rest of the game, and then the game's just going to expire and end. And um, I, I, th this game was really all over the place, and if you haven't seen it in, in its entirety, i definitely go back and check it out. Um, because it was definitely not something you ordinarily see. Fair enough. Let me just keep playing here. The next uh, cut was in about 40 seconds. So you guys are seeing that green and yellow have all of these mills like everywhere, and they're, they're farming up a lot of them, whereas um, blue and red are just kind of cornered. To think that this started off with a failed mole rush... Leon's going to go for a wraparound. Let's see what he can get done here. His army is strong, but I don't know that he can two on one. One owl for Meek, not, not having too much of an impact on the game. Leon's alone. You know, he, he decided to do this move without the support of Satoros. And I think that uh, that was to his detriment here. Because now Satoros comes in and it's just too little too late. Meek and Night Slayer are going to take this game. Despite the failed mole rush, they're going to be able to come back. And w watching this really gets me hyped for a possible uh, rematch Satoros. Oh yeah, it's going to happen. So right in here, uh, I just want to say, if you look at the army composition from green, we've got lizards, we've got falcons, and we've got a wolf. I uh, believe there is a cam or two in there, but only two. Um, and I just want to say, Falcons are so powerful in large numbers, and Wolf buffed even better, but they have such low health. They're really the glass cannons of this game, uh, it seems like, uh, especially when they can clump up in that way. Uh, and Leon's army just didn't really have any tanks. If he had had six Falcons and four cams, maybe, but the Falcons really need a tank to soak damage. And if he had been back with Satoros' army that had a, a couple of skunks and the skunk guests in addition to the two cams, I think that'd be a bit better balanced. But that's just something to keep in mind, I think. It's yeah, I'm, this just came down to coordination, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Definitely just need to be in the same place at the same time. Yeah, and he, yeah, had, the, he had the speedy unit, so he could have retreated as well, but... Uh, right. I, I, he, he has the strongest army on the table right now. Like, if you just look individually at everyone's army, I think Leon has the strongest army. Um, but this was tough. I, I mean, once once you have a threat of an owl, you know, it's hard to really sit back and defend. 
Um, but yeah, it was, it was definitely a very close game. Yeah. I enjoyed casting it and, and watching it as well. And one more thing I want to mention is how far into the game it is. It's 8.30, and, and like you said, there's been all kinds of shenanigans this game with moles and, and moles again, and uh, kind of a turtling play from from blue and red. Um, I, I just want to mention that a lot of RTSs at the end of the day sometimes come down to uh, stamina. How long can you just keep going? And in Tooth and Tail, especially when early game, you can kind of keep track of what your opponent is doing because you can count food. You can, you know, as you're finding where they're at, you uh, counting food is such a big piece of this game, but eight minutes and 30 seconds in, it's so easy for you to miscount. You know, there no longer is as much counting food. You have to go look, but you can't go look because you could die while you're looking. So you have so much less information to run on and you're starting to wear down from eight and a half minutes of constant go, go, go. It's it's really an interesting thing to see how players adapt to that. All right. So that is uh, the highlights from the dual championship here. I'm just going to zoom that. So next, we've got PocketBot Cup. I want to bring up the PocketBot Cup here on this uh, talk show. It's been going on for how long? Do you guys know how long PocketBot Cup has been going on? Years? Oh, yeah, definitely I'm, years. I'm not sure, but yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, and yeah, it's... I don't know if it happened like when the game was first released, but it, uh, from what I understand, it was not not too long after the game was released. They they started doing these automated cups, and uh, yeah, at least I've I've as long as I've been playing, they they've been going on. Uh, we've got a comment in the chat saying since the beginning of times, seems like it. Um, so I, I want to highlight these and and maybe bring a little bit of life, extra life back into it. So Satoros, you've got some stuff you've brought for the puck about cup uh, yeah you take absolutely. it away absolutely yeah i uh, just wanted to talk about you know the puck about cups again they're kind of more of a casual every monday kind of tournament but it's a great it's a great kind of short format tournament that people can just join again depending doesn't matter who you are what your skill level is etc just find matches against other you know good players and uh you know have a good time so uh there's usually uh, technically three Pocketbot Cups, um, but usually two of them actually happen. There's the uh, European and then there's the American. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick recap of, you know, what happened and some cool plays that came out of it. Um, so first, just to cover the results in the European PBC on Monday, uh, we did have the top three being Senzez actually coming in third, which is a very good showing, depending, uh, considering the players that are uh, in that tournament. And... Uh, Coming in second was Lego Man, which is no surprise there. He's he's a very strong player. And then in first place is Big Pimpintosh doing very well. Uh, and uh, pulling out with the, the victory. And um, it was a very close series, a 3-2 win over Lego Man. So really good games there. We'll look at those in just a second. Um, but then on, on the American side, um, we had a bit of a smaller tournament but uh it was still good fun we had a uh, tandor draco here actually came in third so congratulations on that and uh in second place was actually tatanka uh he's usually one of the people who gets first place but uh, i actually managed to beat him out in a close three to one uh series and uh definitely was very stressful but um definitely saw some good games there too uh, i just want a quick uh mention uh, I tend to cast the American one, and Pimpintosh, I believe, is usually the caster for uh, the European PBC. So him getting yep. first place is pretty cool. He probably was playing in first person. Yeah, yeah, he was. It was great to see, definitely. Um, so yeah, there was a couple couple clips that I wanted to show just uh, from some of the games. And um, Tandor, you can go ahead and just mute the audio because I'll be talking over them just to go over them real quick uh, and again thanks to big pimpintosh for always streaming these you know it seems i don't know how many he's missed but not very many he's always there you know good days and bad he's always there watching all the games and uh commentating and just hanging out with people in chat and stuff so it's a good time oh yeah uh, but the first hero. one yeah the uh, first one we have is um actually lego man versus, versus melvin fro now melvin fro again usually is one of the top contenders um but lego man actually uh managed to 2-0 him which is uh pretty surprising in my eyes but 
Lego Man, obviously good enough to take games off of it, but a 2-0 is pretty unusual. And um, just wanted to show, this is game number two, and uh, Lego Man, you go, go ahead and start the clip. But we're going to see uh, Lego Man actually going for, uh, I, honestly, pretty standard, but just very well micro and executed uh, skunk and pigeon push. And it kind of shows the strength of this combination. Uh, just getting those squirrels in position, getting a little bit of gas down with the skunks, and then just kiting back. Again, there's chameleons on the other side. It's not like there's no tech on the other side, but just the strength of kiting with the, the squirrel, skunk, pigeons. Just managed to slowly take out their army, and then all of a sudden there's an uncontested skunk just on top of Warren's, and it's just a slow death from there. Um, just, again, very simple, but very strong and well-executed push, and... Uh, eventually takes the game from here you'll see again continue to kite back and forth try not to commit too hard but again uh Melvin for OEC just takes too much damage and that was it so very well done by Lego man yeah and then the yeah i don't know if uh any of you have experienced that or have any comments keeper do you want to you want to comment about the squirrel pigeon skunk there it's just such a classic tried and true combination it, it'll always be the one of the strongest one base pushes. I mean, especially if your opponent doesn't have lizard, then yeah. the the skunks are just gonna win out over the squirrel based composition of your opponent. So, and then once you have pigeon behind it, if you could have pigeon sealing up your skunks so that they just don't go down, uh, and then if you could even a little later in the game throw in a snake or two, I mean, it's it's so good those kite based compositions. Um, are, are just extremely powerful and you can see Lego had a very good execution as well yeah and one thing I just like to add it's specifically against like squirrels is tier one they're not again not as good against lizards not as good against toads especially just because they're high DPS right they can kind of trade armies and then the pigeons have nothing to heal but when your opponent is relying too much on squirrels it just is devastating and then we have the uh, the second clip here is actually from uh, uh, Tosh versus Lego series, game number two. And uh, you can go ahead and start the clip. Uh, actually, this is... Oh yeah, this is the clip. Okay, well, you'll see here the, uh, the moles coming down from Tosh. This is just a, a normal eight, eight farm opening. Uh, this is gonna be a little little reminiscent of the last uh, major patch before moles got taken out and normally you would think okay well you know that was just the one mole got the cancel on the farm maybe even got one hit in well that's pretty much over nope he's committing to this he's actually using the water to heal his moles to get the most value out of them as possible and he you know he sees this warren just takes it out before any units could actually get built, gets that cancel on the farm, and now he has over three moles, can just start deleting pigs, and just continues to commit. And uh, again, definitely shows that he knows how to play with moles. And again, if your opponent doesn't respond correctly, this is what can happen, even in 1v1s. You can just keep harassing, keep dealing damage to the point where you can oh, just God. delete their mill. And uh, again, very well executed from Tosh. Clearly knows what he's doing. The, the healing from the water, I think, really was the, the the nice touch to it. But yeah, managed to steal that game away. That, that is was, incredible. That was perfect execution. I, I mean, and, and also the decision to go for the Warren. Because if one little yeah. squirrel pops out, then it's just going to kite the moles all day. Um, so the call to go for the Warren and then and then go for the mill, it looked like he calculated it perfectly. Like like the, his mole died as his mole was getting his last hit on the mill to take it out. And it was just, <laughs> uh, that was that was really a work of art. Also, Lego probably should have put that, that Warren in a different location, like behind, you know, so it was safer. Maybe it would have been better for him, but uh, you know, it was uh, very well done. I love seeing plays like that. Yeah, that was incredible. And he kept getting the cancel on that that corner farm. Uh, and then finally, after clearing enough pigs to where he knew he could get to the center of the mill, it was and there was two other warrens on the backside, so all of the decision-making there was spot on. Yep. 
I, I loved how he just put down one mobile run, just one. And then every time he went back to heal up, he added one more. Just continuing the pressure. <laughs> I, I'm sure Legoman couldn't believe his eyes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, that's reminiscent of the before moles were, were nerfed, but even even then so many people just build one mole warren get the one you know farm cancel or whatever and they just leave nope <laughs> absolutely committing and uh you know having the confidence to go for it so props to him so we're moving right. on to the american one uh american pocket yep. cup now yeah just one clip for this one actually this is from my game against uh game one actually against satanka and uh, you can go ahead and play the clip but it was well, a really just, weird map i just want to mention oh. real quick tatanka was playing random plus one here uh, which is funny when you look at the units he has doesn't look that random but he did actually roll random and uh, swap out one unit probably something garbage for the squirrels but i'll go ahead and start <laughs> yeah, it yeah probably um but yeah, it's, uh, it was a really weird map. Tatanka basically only had one entrance to his base, and he was on high ground. So I was just trying to, again, keep map control. And uh, he actually built this mill. We actually traded that mill on the top uh, a couple of times. But basically, he, uh, I wanted to clear it out so I could have a good, a good position to make sure he couldn't like backdoor me or anything. But he used this as an opportunity. Just timed it perfectly with, you know, when his boar was coming out, and he either had the rest of the armory, and uh, fortunately that means my sca uh, my snakes weren't there, and more importantly, I didn't have time to position my army. So there's a big fight that happens. I'm able to clean up, but unfortunately, you can keep playing it, but unfortunately, you'll see the mill goes down, and that was just the beginning of the end. Uh, again, even though I was actually able to clear this up and even counterattack and kill his third base, I just lost too much economy and. Uh, that was game. So, yeah, that was just a good example of <laughs> basically using other distractions on the map to uh, get a good opening to attack. Um, and because one one big fight can just make all the difference. Especially with a board timing. I just want to point out that one moment there. Uh, it's a very sad moment. <laughs> Where we got? Okay. The fight comes in, and right now, you see the two cams and the two snakes just kind of making their way back, like, guys, did we miss anything? What's going on? <laughs> Meanwhile, all of the rest <laughs> of our army exactly. is just being demolished. It's just so sad. <laughs> uh, yep. But good game sense from Tatanka there. And, and one of the things, you know, that this that this highlights, too, is, like, the boar, most people think, oh, the bomb, oh, the AoE, oh, the damage, but I think the best strength is just the tankiness. How many Falcon shots did that boar absorb, uh, absorb in that fight, right? Like, like Satoros had the high Falcon count, but it didn't matter because the boar could just take so many shots. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, you know, this is what makes Tatanka such a great player is because he's just watching the minimap and looking for, you know, the opponent's movement of their army and their commander. And they go in at the exact right second to, to get their advantage. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah, that was that was it. That was the recap. Just a couple of uh, good highlights. And uh, again, I encourage anybody watching who's, uh, again, don't want to commit to anything uh, too extravagant, but want to just get some uh, good games in with some other good players. I highly encourage everybody to sign up on Mondays. So. Yeah. Yeah. Not not all the uh, ranked is not always alive. Uh, usually you can find somebody on there, but you know if if you're just looking for some games, Pocketbook Cup is perfect. And uh, it's not when you first look at it, it looks a little confusing. Like you have to type what now and send your replays where now. It's once you get the hang of it, you just ask you know somebody like Eel or or Masta. Well, Masta's kind of running it, but anybody really. Pretty straightforward. It ends up being kind of nice. Plus, you get to have your game streamed. That's, yeah. that's always fun and exciting. I, I thought that was really cool when I first came to the community. Like, oh, wow, like my game's live. Like I, there's people talking about it right now. Like, so that's really cool. Yeah, definitely. Especially if you want, you know, feedback on your play, want to get better. It's a great way to do it. Yeah. All right. So moving on, the next uh, piece of our weekly news is the community highlights. We've got some stuff from Kipo here. Um, we've got Kipo with his ladder watch. And uh, I believe, Kipo, this is from the in-game ladder ranking statistics as well as the camel bot. So if you want to, if you've got the camel bot stuff, do you want to introduce that as well? 
Yeah, let's do it. So checking out the ladder, this was pulled yesterday. We still have number one, our leader, our champion, Tatanka, in first place with 1,400 ladder points. Underneath him, we have Haru, who's also playing as Ploob. You might have seen him in, in Discord hmm. with uh, 1,253. So right there, I mean, from, from first to second, 1,400 Tatanka underneath Haru at 1,253. It's such a big gap. You know, Meek used to be up there with Tatanka. They were going back and forth, you know, all the time about, you know, who is number one. Um, but now Tatanka is really reigning supreme. So let me ask you guys this. Do you think Tatanka will be dethroned by the end of season four? Is it is it possible, given the lead that he has sustained? Yes. Uh, I'm going to... Look. Go it, ahead. It, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely possible that he's dethroned. Um, he, you know, I don't think he's going to disappear or anything. Don't, don't get me wrong. But uh, that's one of the great things about this game is you never know when somebody new or somebody existing just decides to start really grinding games and starting to get better. And uh, especially if they decide to hit the ladder a lot, that there definitely could be some competition there. I don't know when season four rankings are going to end. It's very possible that if they end in the next month or two, that they'll still be way up top, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. So going off so, of uh, yeah. the end of Satoros' comment there, the end of Season 4 is approaching pretty uh, pretty swiftly. We've got some news coming up about that as well. So I'd, I could see him just staying up there until next season and having to start over. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, we, we will get into that. Do you know the three players that have the only three players in the world that have hit 1,400. Can you guys guess them? Erlu. I'm going to guess yeah, Gentleman. Er, er, well, so Gentleman might have done it last season, but at least to my knowledge this season, oh, this it's season. been... It, to my knowledge, it's been Erlu, Tatanka, and Meek have been yeah. the only three to, to reach that threshold. So, well, awesome. so yeah, so, Congrats so that's to super exciting. Underneath Haru at a close third place, we actually have a tie. Melvin and Night Slayer both have uh, 1,228. And then Amari in fifth at 1,214. So, yeah, Night Slayer is slowly creeping up the ladder. Like I said, currently ranked third. Um, so if there is someone that could challenge Tatanka, I honestly wouldn't be surprised in the least if it was Night Slayer. I, I would say potentially Amari, but I just don't think she plays enough. Going into the weekly, weekly camel rating, Flash is in first, 22 wins and five losses. Uh, Flash is me, you know, I, I, it came out of the last <laughs> stream. I, I changed my name because I was watching a lot of StarCraft 1 uh, because, you know, Flash is obviously the god of StarCraft 1. Tatanka in second in the week, 17 and 11, playing on little Tatanka, and Amari in third at eight and one. And I want to give a shout out to Amari because I think it's really cool to see these old school players come back and, you know, continue to be a part of the community, engage with the community and just get on ladder and start grinding out games. I mean, Amari was like one of the original OGs. I don't know if y'all remember back when Tooth and, Tooth, uh, Tooth and Tail came out, the, you know, some of the big names back in the day, like Gentlemen, like Amari, like Mishi. These are sort of, you know, the, the old guard, if you will. So. I think it's pretty cool that, that Amari, you know, pops into the scene every now and then and you'll see her on ladder and she's an insanely strong player. Like her micro is up there. H have you guys run into Amari ever? I have yeah. not. Not recently, but uh, I have in the past, definitely. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> definitely a very good lizard player. That's that's what I know Amari for. Oh, from when, uh, yeah, that, the uh, Fiona, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, before that, but yeah. Right. And also a player I've seen, not necessarily on ladder, but I've seen him on Discord and I've seen him pop into Pimp Stream every now and then is Jet Erickson. So pretty cool that we have these old school players sort of coming back and really just, you know, being a part of the community, which is nice. And then season four rankings, 
top three. Do you, any of you guys know who's number one right now? Uh, uh, for... I just looked, so I won't say. Uh, <laughs> this is the top camel rankings for season four? Yes, it's the camel. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, Kipo, could you take actually a moment to to explain to anybody in the chat who doesn't know what is the camel? Right, so the raw, the raw ladder ranking we were mentioning earlier is just the in-game ranking that you see when you load up Tooth and Tail and you hit play ranked. Camel is a little more sophisticated because the regular uh, ladder ranking is just based on wins, losses within, you know, people within your area. But Camel takes into consideration the win-loss rate of your opponent. So, uh, you know, a win on Camel uh, over an opponent that is, you know, 501, for example, is going to be massive. It's going to boost your ranking through the roof. But if that same player only has, you know, 800 points on the ladder and you have 300 points, you're probably only going to get three or four points. Camel is basically a more sophisticated formula uh, that takes multiple things into consideration as opposed to the more simple uh, ladder formula which is what you see when you log into the game so number one for season four is actually melvin and frau with 743 wins and 327 losses which to me is insane amari's going to take up that number two spot with 758 wins and 291 losses wow and Haru with 173 wins and 51 losses in third. So, you know, once again, these these are some old school giants that are just absolute powerhouses. So congrats to Melvin Fro. It looks like he's probably going to take away first place in season four. Awesome. All right. I think... Moving right on here to the unit discussion chunk uh, in the discords. Uh, keep doing explain what that is. And I need to step away for just a moment. So I'm just going to hide the camera and I'll be right back. Take it away. Sure. So I don't know if y'all have been to unit discussion. It's a pretty cool place to learn about the metagame and figure out what people are talking about, what the hot topics in the community are. I think it's the most interesting little thread in the TNT Discord that we have. So each episode, I'm going to take a look at what's being talked about, what's the gossip, what's the word on the street, and bring it to you. Uh, we had Goris starting out the drama of the week in unit Discord, in unit discussion chat. He was asking about a deck, specifically a deck with an owl in it, saying, you know, how can I make this deck, you know, the best possible iteration, you know, maybe take out a snake, add a barbed wire, etc., etc. QQ comes in out of left field. I'm sure you guys all know QQ. Tr Trumpet, you're going to be uh you're going to be featured on this part. I see you in the chat. So QQ comes in out of left field basically. I'm sure you guys all know him. He's a great player, premier level premier level player. He also has a awesome stream which is extremely entertaining. Streams Tooth and Tail in StarCraft 2, saying, I predict eventually the end game composition will be Owl Artie. QQ's basically staking out this position that Owl Artie is unexplored, super powerful. Give it another eight months, he says, it will become very meta, at least by the end of the year. This is an Owl artillery and then just your average, you know, tier two composition. Trumpet comes out to challenge the position saying he doesn't think so. It's not really anything new or too experimental. Trumpet says, in general, I prefer Balloon over Artie. Depending on the map, Artie can def get you in a super good position, but I think Balloon is more reliable. Balloons are often a better way to secure a position. So I wanted to ask you both, and I'll start with you, Satoros. You ha you're building your composition. You know it's going to be Owl. It's going to be, you know, your generic tier two, whether you want to do Falcon, Skunk, Snake, Squirrel, etc. Are you going to match your Owl with an Artie? Are you on QQ team? Or are you going to use a Balloon? Are you team Trumpet? So uh, the first thing I'll say just in general is Artie is super powerful, mostly because of its ridiculous range. Um, Plus the fact that it can hit enemy buildings like, oh, I don't know, maybe mills. <laughs> so <laughs> that fact means that on it's it's basically if you're given a really good map, it could just 
almost single-handedly win you the game. Um, but that being said, it is very map dependent. Um, it's not as good, especially on maps that are very open, open. There's a lot of different angles of attack, that sort of thing. Um, and balloons, I almost see as like not the opposite uh, because all defenses are map dependent, but uh, balloons definitely fit a different role. Instead of like this super dangerous, either offensive threat or just kind of a uh, big control an area sort of deal, balloons also control an area but again they they act a little differently and most importantly they uh they have flying vision essentially they they reveal a very large area of the map um which make them a, an excellent tool if you have a bad map meaning uh specifically if you have like cliffs or just high ground in front of your bases it's a great way to try to equal equalize that that disadvantage that you have um and kind of at the end of the day this is partially my personal preference because i can see an argument for Artie, for sure it is powerful but i would say if i'm trying to build an owl deck my my basically goal is can i get a bunch of owls um, so it's going to be relatively defensive, relatively slow, not particularly aggressive trying to grab map control and then like, you know, uh, try to contain somebody. Uh, so I would usually go for balloon in that case, um, just because I basically want to mitigate any disadvantage I have and just turn it into a really slow, grindy match where I can get a bunch of owls and win that way. The Tauros is on Team Trumpet. Tandor, are you going Q, Q, Team QQ or Team Trumpet? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that I'm newer to the game than both of you guys, and a little lower level. Um, I think QQ has a point that the Arty has a pretty high skill ceiling, and potentially with certain details worked out, it can definitely increase in usage and power. But. I also just love seeing things in RTS, and the balloon is one of the... But between the balloon and the mine, uh, just so good at gathering information, which can have such powerful indirect influence on a game. Um, combined with the effect of enough balloons to actually cut off scouting and kill a commander as they approach, I, I gotta give it to the balloon, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on Team Trumpet here. But, you know, I, I'd like to see the art used in more creative ways as well, so I'd encourage the... Uh, I'd encourage that as well. I've run the Owl uh, Artie deck, and I did it with Lizards as my tier one, basically. Lizards just run around the map like crazy to distract while the Artie goes up. But that being said, given my experience with the game, I'm on Team Trumpet as well. I just think the Balloon is more consistent. The Balloon will help you get the Owl up something that will hurt an owl player or any player with a tier three for that matter is just the vulnerability that you have while the tier three is building so the balloon will help you get it up and the balloon is a counter to falcons um you know there's sort of uh, similar roles the the owl and the artillery right they both don't shoot up they both cover you know mass swaths of land with their, I know Al, Al technically not AOE, but there's so many little mice here, so it's almost like it is AOE. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I prefer the anti Falcon. I, I think it's, uh, I think there's just more utility. I think uh, the artillery is a little more map dependent. So, it's an interesting discussion. If you haven't checked it out, I would go check it out between, well, it's with a few different players, but the, the thrust of it is really discussion between trumpet and qq which are two excellent high level players now yeah do we think we don't think the the uh, artillery in situations like that would need any kind of buff do we it seems like it's still pretty viable in its own situations okay i i'll be honest i just i wish the arty did true aoe instead of just hitting three targets but that's the only change I would make to it. Arty is definitely a dangerous thing to make too overpowered because then you just have miserable games. But um, I definitely think there could be a change. I agree. I, I think it, it has its place in the game, but you know, 
uh, you don't really see it that often in competitive one-on-one -on -one matches. Unless you have a pocket build, a very specific strategy that focuses around it. Which is the same with a bunch of other units in this game. Ferret, for example, and Mole. <laughs> uh, you often have your build just focused around those units. But I, I think it has its place. Um, and if if there was the a, a hair of a buff, I, I wouldn't be complaining about it. I, uh, I just burst out laughing because I saw in the chat, Trumpet said, Artie should have full map range. <laughs> and I think that's the cue to move on. <laughs> uh, where are we moving on to? Is that it for the uh, unit discussion there, Kipo? Yeah, just wanted to highlight that uh, that back and forth. Like I said, very cool. Go check it out if you haven't already. Okay, so one last thing for community highlights here, just briefly. Um, in my Discord uh, for this stream i have a tnt builds channel where i specifically just look for what's a 1v1 build what what are six units you you like to do um and i'd like to feature those and somebody posted let me actually figure out who i'm giving credit to here okay this was night slayer he posted one of tiki gray's guides uh tiki gray has a youtube channel he's he's a really really strong player and he's been uh vocal on his opinions on strategy as well um he's calling it a timing push and this is the squirrel toad falcon skunk snake cam thing and keep i know you have opinions on this as a uh a deck for instruction um but i wanted to get you guys opinions on the difference between uh so take all all four of those tier two units right everybody but the ferrets and then squirrels but what are the ups and downs of adding toads versus adding lizards versus adding pigeons as the second tier one unit to that? Does that make sense? Can you either pull it up or just repeat the build so I can write it down? Yeah, so... I, yes, I can pull it up here. Just... Yeah, it's... it's there uh... it is. Yeah, there you go. So Scroll I'm looking at the uh, timing the tier two except uh, ferrets. Yeah, so I'm looking at the, uh, the modern and the alt here. Don't worry about the bottom two builds. Uh, this was... Posted by Night Slayer, uh, credit to Tiki Gray here. What am I looking for? So it's so it's Squirrel Toad and then just standard four tier two. Yes, yeah, yeah but I'm I'm ah. saying what's the difference between the Squirrel Toad standard four tier two, when compared to Squirrel Pigeon four tier two or Squirrel Lizard four tier two? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Taurus, what do you think? And then I could jump in. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I do have opinions on this, or maybe not opinions, but more thoughts. First of all, I think all three of these are quite viable. I don't, I don't even think any of these is strictly better than the other. Um, they just have definitely different textures, I would say. Um, so I've actually been running Squirrel Pigeon a lot for my tier one, um, but I'll cover the first one first. So Squirrel Toad plus all those tier two is, I, I think, the most straightforward and solid. Um, you have squirrels, which are obviously just the most well-rounded tier one, but then you have toads. Squirrel toad can deal with a lot of things. First of all, the toads basically give you a very good matchup against somebody who's just going lizards. Um, toads are also quite good later in the game when you have, you know, just big clumps of units, even tier two, um, especially if they have like cams or something like that. Um, they can be quite strong. Um, so it's a way to have two different, both useful tier ones until later in the game. Um, and then obviously all the tier two, that's kind of your, your goal is Falcons. Falcons are really your goal if you're gonna play a long game. But the fact that you have access to Skunk Snakes and Cams means you can win games like in the mid game pretty easily um, if you're given the right opening and Falcons are kind of like your Again, if the game happens to go long, I'll just transition into a whole bunch of Falcons. So by having Squirrel Toad and Skunk Snake Cam and Falcons basically means you're, you are strong through most of the game. You're going to have a strong early game. You're going to have a strong mid game and you'll still be able to compete in the late game. It won't be as strong as something like a triple tier three or something like that. But at least you'll have the ability to play a close game. Um, as far as that versus pigeons and lizards, pigeons is basically saying okay i'm gonna give up my early game strength and just try to really win in that mid game 
like just be absolutely oppressive in the mid game. And again, you saw in one of the clips before with Lego Man using it with just just two skunks, two skunks, three falcons. Uh, sorry, three pigeons, and then a bunch of squirrels. Like, it's just it's super strong. Especially you had that with snakes. Um, even a couple falcons if they don't have enough anti air. You can just make such strong pushes with that. Um, that it, it's super scary. But again, all of a sudden, you're a lot more vulnerable to lizards. Um, you're not as good in squirrel, like just tier one fights. Like if you have squirrel toad, you're gonna beat somebody who just has squirrels. Um, so you are kind of giving up that early game again for more mid, mid game strength. Um, and then finally with lizards, uh, <laughs> the unit that everybody loves to hate and hates to love, but <laughs> it's, <sighs> Lizards, again, definitely strengthen your early game for sure. If your opponent doesn't have toads or doesn't have an early, uh, you know, a good way to dealing with it, you can just kind of run people over. Even if they do have toads, uh, Squizzard, as it's referred to, is still really strong. And lizards give you the opportunity to abuse maps that, um, you know, the other units just don't. If you get a favorable map with lizards in your deck, you can be at a serious advantage. Um, if it's a wide open map where you just have room to run around or there's just multiple different paths that your opponent has to defend both at the same time to not lose to a base race, like that can give you a, a significant advantage. The downside is lizards don't really, like they don't perform as well later into the game. Uh, if you're just talking about, you know, death ball versus death ball, lizards are not really the unit you want to have. So you kind of give up some of that, uh, again, just pure raw strength in mid and late game for being able to abuse maps a lot more and again still having some early game strength i like that as a as a pretty comprehensive overview so keepa let me ask you this then um a lot of the stuff we talk about is kind of at the intermediate level you know we a lot of the premier players have figured a lot of this out a lot of beginner players are struggling with other things and so a lot of this is is for intermediates really trying to get their gaming to the next level. But for those beginners, uh, Kipo, when I was not that good, when I was starting, this was back in Clan Wars, you told me, run this uh, run this deck to learn unit counters and stuff with tier twos. So can you talk a little bit about how much of a core concept you think that is, and if that opinion has changed over the last couple months? Absolutely. So I just want to say, uh, Satoros, that was like really beautifully said. I, I basically 100% agree with everything that you said. And, it, you know, if you're just tuning in, like, and you're a new player and you want to learn the game, um, just listen to that Satoro speech because I, I think there there's a lot of value in, in a lot of the points that you had brought up. And, and before I dive into this, um, this conversation topic can be a podcast in and of itself. I mean, we could really get lost talking about the combinations and the specific build uh but uh, but i'll try and be as as brief as i can be i i do think that this is the absolute best way to learn the game if you're a new player and you're coming into tooth and tail you need to understand how the units interact with each other and the tier two units are the most important units in the game that is going to be in if you play 100 games those are those units are going to have the most impact on those games your army is is basically comprised of tier two units and to know how they interact with each other and how they counter one another and when to use them and how to use them is to master and understand the fundamentals of tooth and tail so yeah i i 100 think that for running for tier two falcon skunk snake chameleon specifically uh is is 100% what you should be doing when you first dive into Tooth and Tail. So you learn, okay, Falcons are the glass cannons. I'm going to use them later. They're going to be my late game composition. Skunk is to counter tier one. Snake is for utility. Uh, uh, Chameleon can, can be a, a, a harassment tool. Chameleon can also be a soft counter to lizards. Um, I, I, I like the, the, squirrel to the squirrel toad variation. Personally, I think it's the strongest. But that's only because I think that toads happen to be uh, a bit overpowered right now. Once we get into the next patch, this whole entire story is going to change. Lizards are too map dependent. And when you're facing a good player, they know how to defend against them. You know, uh, uh, even when it comes to straight up engagements, 
as a lizard player, the lizards have to flank. And if they're not flanking, then they're not going to be of any kind of value. And I, I completely agree with what you said earlier, Satoros. With the pigeons, you are giving up the early game uh, in favor of the mid game. And, you know, pigeons, they work very well with you, other units that can kite, like snakes and skunks and squirrels. So pigeon, snake, skunk, squirrel, you have all of the ingredients there for probably the, the strongest, or if not one of the strongest mid-game pushes. You see players like Floor Delays, for example, use this build very often. So yeah, I, I mean, this is what you want to chew on if you're just getting into the game. And if you're playing today, I would experiment with the Toad variation and I would focus on mastering how to use toads and how to play against toads because that's really the key to to the early game as well as the mid game in the meta as it stands right now today okay so moving on here um we've got speaking of new patches and old patches and stuff we've got some news coming up um but i want to real quick talk about some upcoming events um we've uh do we have any news about the TNT Championship. This is the number one, 1v1, the biggest, the most publicized event that we do. And I think it's twice yearly. Um, but do you guys have any information about that? Oh, yeah, I... well, Sorry, oh. I just, I have to jump off. Uh, oh, okay. So Thank you for being uh, here, Satoros. Yeah, it was great talking to you all. Uh, sadly, I can't be here for any longer, but uh, thanks to everybody out there who's listening to us. Hopefully you enjoyed some of our conversations and Again, thanks for Pandor for hosting this and Kippo for joining the conversations. And All right, have a nice day. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll talk later again about uh, where this show is going to go, um, future stuff and all that. But So, yeah, uh, tournament's coming up. Cool. Thanks, Sat. It was uh, it was a lot of fun hearing your insights as usual. And if you're still here, I'm wishing you luck in the 2v2 championship, man. I'll be rooting for you and Leon right until the very end. Looks like he's headed out here. TNT Championship. This is huge. I, I mean, to me, this is the number one tournament in in all of Tooth and Tail. I, I think it's the most to look forward to. Uh, everyone really enjoys it. Um, I, before we get into the future, Tandor, I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. What did you think about the format of the TNT Championship? So this was my first championship. I wasn't around for earlier ones, um, so bear that in mind and take my opinion with a grain of salt, but I liked it. Um, remind me again what the differences were between this one and the previous ones. We had GSL style groups this time, last time around, and the previous times we just have huge groups. You'll be in a group with eight players, the top four will advance to the bracket, the bottom four will be eliminated, so you're playing seven games within a period of a month, and then you're going to a bracket. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So I am a huge fan of the GSL style. Um, I've I haven't seen much GSL specifically, but ASL is the uh, StarCraft One equivalent, um, and it's the exact same format. And I absolutely love. I love that format. So um, I enjoyed making sense of it when I was okay. So I've watched enough ASL that I kind of know what to expect. And when I was actually playing in it, it was nice to. Uh, to keep it straight in my own mind, kind of know what to expect. So I, I liked it right. a lot. I think it's very hype and it's uh, very manageable. Yeah. Well, so we're going to see, you know, we still haven't decided on a format for the next championship. Um, what we do know right now is that it'll probably launch. Let me just get out my calendar sometime late July, early August. So the tail end of the summer is when I suspect the next Tooth & Tail Championship will take place. But one thing I wanted to tell everyone who's listening now or in the future, you know, the previous tournament, a lot of the groundwork was done by myself. Of course, it was led by Marmu. We had uh, the gentleman helping us out, as well as the Sassy Marques. Um, and we're looking for organizers. You know, we're basically always looking for organizers because it, it's more or less a volunteer position. It's like, you know, <laughs> you're just putting in your time to, to help the community so you know i'm just putting this out there if anyone's interested in the organization of what i think is the ultimate tooth and tail tournament just dm me kipo i'm on discord all the time 
and, and we can get you involved in the planning of the next championship. We, I, I think we're looking for organizers pretty much. If anyone's ever interested, let me know and I can talk to you about it. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it again. Uh, I'm going to get trying to train up again because I think they're going to throw me into the intermediate <laughs> level considering I got second beginner. So it'll be pretty intense, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, next, we've got an announcement for 21 duels um, run by the gentleman. I'm going to announce that real quick. I know that a uh, gentleman is about to announce this in his own Discord for it as well. Um, but that is going to be starting the, where is it? The 18th of June. So 21 duels, the summer season. Uh, he's got a season for each, uh, or he's got a season for each season. Ha. But 21 summer is starting on the 18th of June. The bosses have already been picked, I believe. Um, and working on the formats for those. One of the cool things about 21 Duels is, uh, hey, thanks for the bit there. Jet Erickson, we were just talking about you earlier. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that is really cool about the 21 Duels is the strange formats that get thrown in. Um, Keepa, do you wanna talk about your experience with that? Or your memory? Yeah, so uh, I haven't participated in it, but I know that everyone that does participate in it absolutely loves it. If you haven't checked it out yet, uh, I'm sure the sign up will, will probably be going up in within the next two weeks. We'll have a sign up period. Um, but everyone that, that plays in it says it's a lot of fun. I'll probably be casting, you know, whatever I can get my hands on. Um, so you'll be challenging, you know, several bosses. So you'll come in as a player if you're a player and you have the first boss. And the, the rules are, you know, they're different for each stage of the tournament. So you might play a game with only three units, or you might play a game with a random unit selection, or the opponent might have nine units and you might have four, and you might have to find a way to overcome, you know, that, uh, that difficulty. So everyone that plays in it absolutely loves it. It's really cool and it's a lot of fun. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, and it is, it is uh, pretty beginner friendly as well. So there's uh, a lot of room for that as well. Uh, next thing we've got lined up here is Kibo. You have an announcement about a new tournament you're going to be starting. I'm I'm really excited about this. I've been thinking about it for a long time. I wanted to launch a daily show, or not a daily, but at least something that's weekly, something akin to the Delphius uh, feast. So it's going to be every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it, it's kind of friendly for everyone i think i know it's a little late for some folks in europe um but yeah it's going to be a king of the hill style format all players of all skill levels are absolutely uh you know uh can enter and you will be matched as a player with someone with uh, a comparable level of experience with the game the way that it's going to work is there will be three hills. There could be four, depending on how many people I get. But there's going to be three one-on-one -on -one best of five matches. The winner is going to stay on. He's going to claim the title of King of the Hill. And next week, he is going to have to face a challenger. And however many games he wins, that is going to be his score for the tournament, more or less. So if you're the best player in the world and you want to prove it, come to the tournament play each week and the more you win the more notoriety you will get and it's going to be a lot of fun so um where can people go to find out more about this if they want to see what you've kind of described there in a written format and where to go to sign up and all that where can people go for that so to sign up so i made the decision i'm not going to have a dedicated discord to this i know there are already a lot of tnt discords I'm just going to do everything in the Pocket Watch Games Discord. So all you have to do is go to the tournaments channel. That's where you get the full rundown of the format, as well as uh, an FAQ section for frequently asked questions. And all you have to do is, is react to this post. By reacting to this post, I will automatically put you in the queue to play. And then basically what I'm going to do later, probably after the stream, is I'm gonna randomize all the participants and I'm gonna reach out to everyone that signed up and the people that get lucky that are gonna be able to play on week one. I'll just confirm that they're available to play. They'll play their best of five set on their own. 
I'll stream it this Sunday at 6 o'clock Eastern Time. Like I said, the winner will stay on, and then he'll live to fight another day, and the unfortunate loser will go to the bottom of the queue, and he'll have his chance to fight whoever the current king is once he's up. So check it out. It's in the... Let me just take a look. I believe it's the Pocket Watch Games Discord in the tournament section. You could always just DM me, Kipo, or you could react to this post and you'll be added to the list of participants. Awesome. Thank you. And that is up right now. I just went over and reacted myself, so excited for that. Uh, last thing on this uh, section, where is my notes? Uh, Clan Wars, just briefly, are there plans of Clan Wars coming back anytime soon? Ah, uh, yeah, Clan Wars. So I just want to talk about this briefly because a bunch of people have actually asked me about it and I've kind of been putting it off. But right now, I, I don't have any current plans to renew the Clan Wars tournament. Uh, you know, it, it is logistically kind of a challenge and it kind of requires a lot of participants and a lot of organization and I, while I think the most recent Clan Wars was a lot of fun and it was successful, I'm not confident that I, that I currently have the player base to launch another Clan Wars. With that said, if anyone objects that they should reach out to me and message me and talk to me. Uh, you know, if someone wants to carry the torch, I, I won't hold it against them. We, I, I don't want to split the community into too many different directions. Right, so you know, once we have Gents Tournament and then we have the TNT Championship, finding time to dedicate to, to have players dedicate to Clan Wars as well, I think would probably be a challenge. But if anyone does want to talk to me about Clan Wars and completely disagrees with my position and thinks, you know what, Clan Wars was too it's too much fun, we can and we should and we need to do it again, then let me know and we'll talk and we'll try to plan something and figure it out. But I think right now I'm just going to be focusing on King of the Hill, which will run until the TNT Championship, probably in late July, early August. And at that time, we'll just claim, hey, whoever has the most the most kills, the highest kill count atop the King, atop the Hill, then they're going to be the winner. Awesome. All right. So moving on, we've got... Uh... Illuminatus reached out to me, and he's also been posting on some of the discords, and I wanted to talk to you. Um, we missed Satoros on this one, but I wanted to talk to you and the chat, if you guys want to reach out as well, um, about some suggestions for balance. This is, generally speaking, a hot topic when it comes to RTSs and games in general receiving balance patches. Um, so I want to throw out some of Ail's uh, suggestions and see what the feedback is, as well as give a uh, request for additional um, testing and support. So let's start with some of these balance patches. I just, as of right at the beginning of this um, stream, I got an updated list of Ail's suggestions on what he would like to change. So let me just start with one at a time. We'll run down and see what people think. First one... Um, and there is a, by the way, there is a mod, I believe, that you can download and to test these to help Eel and the other devs figure out how to, uh, how to test and get through these and, and see if they're going to be good for the next patch. So let me just start with the beginning one for the commander, uh, commander reveals where you stand still and see what the enemy is, uh, like cams and mines and stuff. Uh, it looks like he's looking to change that from two seconds to 1.6. Now, I recall it used to be shorter yet, and it received a nerf from 1.2 or 1.3 to, to 2 seconds, but he's looking to make it a little bit more quick, so it's a little bit more usable, uh, probably against cams. I see commanders revealing mines a lot, but cams are a little bit harder to catch. So what are you thinking of that? You know, it's interesting, because I, I had I looked over the patch notes before uh, <laughs> for the, the cat, this uh, recording today. And I was thinking to myself, you know what, this is a no-brainer a no because the commander reveal time is just simply too long. You know, mines and chameleons are, it's too tedious to, to waste your time to go to a location, stand there for two seconds, see that there's no mine, step forward five feet and do the same thing again. That was my initial thought that, that 
this is going to be a good change. But then I, 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 as we're talking about it now, you know, how impactful on competitive tooth and tail are chameleons and our minds? I don't really see not... I don't see minds right. used that often at all, and cams are used a bit more. But this is potent. This is effectively a a nerf to cams and minds. We should think of it that way instead of an effect on the commander. I agree. So, yeah, I, I, that's what I was thinking. So, I like it. I like the patch, um, but I also think that, uh, like like you said, cams and minds just aren't. Um, they're not the at the forefront of what I have as my short list of issues with the game right now. Okay, fair. And uh, actually connected to that one, uh, mines are in this list as well to be uh, adjusted. So let me mention that one. Mines, uh, he says here, five second build time from 10. So this is cutting the build time from mines in half. Uh, adding a two second sell time during which the mine is revealed and can be attacked. This reminds me of when you sell a uh, a mill. There's actually a time when it still exists for a, for a hot second, two seconds though, um, and then an eight second sing or sorry an eight single target damage down from fourteen, so less damage. Um, and there's a new function as well he's suggesting. But let me just start with that. So cutting the build time in half, adding a sell time when it is revealed and can be destroyed, uh, and then dropping the damage from 14 to 8 on a single target. On on paper, it looks like a nerf to the mine, which it doesn't really seem to make that much sense because the mines are not strong or overpowered uh, as is, right? Um, but I, ta I also uh, spoke with Il about it briefly. I think it was in unit discussion uh, a few weeks back, and... Um, he's really envisioning this as a role change like if you're retreating from a position the mines go up and your opponent can't pursue because there are mines in the way which makes a lot of sense but the reality is that the change to the mine is so drastic like so many of, of its attributes are being changed that you really can't envision simply is this going to be a buff or is this going to be a nerf I, yeah. I, you know i think this really needs to be tested to figure out uh, how it unfolds. I like the, the, the instant sell to two seconds is gonna be tough and, and the damage reduction. I mean, they're, they're really already as is not super strong against something like a lizard run by. Right. So now you're just gonna have to put even more mines down to, to stop any kind of lizard run by with say nine lizards or more. So let um, me now mention the uh, additional property of revealing cloaked units. And this is, a, this would be a brand new function for mines uh, and for the game in general, actually, because previously only commanders could do it. And so that would allow you to see other mines, but specifically cams, even on the mini map. Um, it, it would give you that kind of vision of of cams coming around for a poke. So is the that new functionality combined with half build time, much quicker time to lay down? enough to combat the nerf of the damage and uh, not being able to sell as easily. I like that, and I think that is going to offset some of mine and other players' concerns that the mines are, are becoming a bit weaker. Um, I think that that's, that that's a really good utility to have in your deck. Whether it's going to justify a slot in the new meta, we're just going to have to see. Um, but in any event, I love what Yil's doing, just generally speaking because these aren't simple little tweaks. Like these are, this is essentially a new unit. The yeah, old and, mine and, and this mine are completely separate. And I think the mine could use a bit of a change here. Uh, Eel is correcting me saying it's it's when it gets triggered by a cam, the cam would be revealed, not just any. I, I wonder what it would be like to have the mines actually just constantly revealing cams. That would be pretty rough on cams, but he's just saying it gets triggered by a cam and that's when the cam is revealed. Um, right. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Mines are not used all that often um, and giving them a change of roles more to a scouting role and less of a defensive role that's basically done better by a lot of other things like uh, 
barbed wire, turrets, you know what I mean? Yep, absolutely. So that's there. And, and guys, this is there is a mod for this where you can test these patches out, and EO is looking for more data to test and see what the implications are. So if you're interested in playing with some of this stuff, please go out there into the uh, Steam community. Uh, there's a link here that I can share in some of the discords, or, or EO probably has on the... Uh, on his discord but uh let's move on to toads so toads you were just talking about how important they are in the current meta so here is a change from eight hit points to nine adding a little bit more health getting rid of the road speed from 1.3 to just one speed in all terrains um dropping the single target damage from four to two uh so it kind of slows it down a little bit reduces the damage a little bit but gives them a little bit more hit points uh, to be resistant from squirrel and pig fire. What do you think of that change? I love it. I think it's great. I mean, I was calling for the slowdown of the toad pretty much since day two after this patch dropped. <laughs> I, I really do hope that this change takes place. And the reason that I say that is because I think what good good game mechanics, what makes the game dynamic and good is is things that encourage micro. And if you could actually kite toads, like you can't really do that right now, but you could do it last patch very easily, mm -hmm. then it, then that's the kind of mechanic that I'm looking for, because that's what's going to separate a very good player, a player with game knowledge and with skill, from from somebody else. And that's where we're going to see the divide and the and the you know dynamic plays. Oh, maybe now we have to flank with the toads. Um, so I, I love it. I think this is absolutely a step in the right direction. I, I can't wait for this patch to drop just for this change alone. The, the reduction in the, um, in the damage and the reduction in speed. Hey, I'll live with the HP buff, you know? I'm not a big Toad fan personally. Never have been, never will be, but I think this is a great change. What do you think? Um, I'm going to go a little different direction with this. Toads, I don't believe, are really overpowered in the current patch. They are dominant and slightly better than, like, the Squirrel Toad is slightly better than the Squirrel Lizard in a lot of people's opinions. And they do rule the meta, but I don't think they're overpowered. Now, having said that, I do like this change, because as you were saying, more micro is better. I am a huge proponent of the higher the skill ceiling in an RTS, the better it is, just objectively. Um, it's one of the reasons I think StarCraft is one of the best RTSs ever, you know, not to make this about that, but... It has an incredibly high skill ceiling, and that is what makes the game so dynamic. So the ability to kite toads by cutting their speed to allow for more skill to show itself, I'm all about. I don't know about the, the damage cut, because the uh, I feel like if you cut the toad's damage in half, it, goes, it would be too much of a nerf, and it would go from you can avoid them to why bother avoiding them, they're just not good anymore kind of thing. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but I'm a toad hater. <laughs> and I'm a toad lover, so I <laughs> I would say uh, I'd want to see some testing, but the HP buff, interesting. Um, it would kind of make them a little bit better against squirrels, which, I don't know, I kind of like the fact that they're good against lizards but not against squirrels, but I don't know. Oh, okay, hang on. Eel is saying it's only the single target damage. AoE remains the same. So groups of right. units would still be countered but individual units yeah okay okay I'll, I'll buy that I'll, I'll back off that's good a a aoe is a is a is a good thing and and there's not that much of it in tooth and tail so that's good i like it yeah all right so moving on here moles so moles received the biggest drop uh oh yes good good point let me put these on the screen here if i can they, they should also I, I i don't believe they're Eel can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if, if this iteration is on the public test, but they should be on Steam uh, as well. Um, yes. So, But for the moment, this is kind of a funky way of doing it, but let me get... Oh, is that readable? they're also pinned in Discord. Okay, they are pinned in the Discord as well. Tail. Yeah, if you go to the Tooth and Tail Discord and you just hit the little pin button, you should see the balance. Plus, there we go. So that ought to help for just now, though, uh, anybody who doesn't want to go to the Discord at the moment. So we're looking at moles here. So moles, um, 
they received a gigantic nerf, which I think was called for because of how dominant they were. Um, and this is kind of going half back to it. So now because they're so weak in almost every situation, Eel is, pro is uh, proposing kind of slightly undoing the nerf. And what we're looking at here is the Mole Warren has more hit points and loses less per mole spawn. So the effective difference is up to 12 moles can now spawn from a Warren before it's destroyed uh, instead of 6, I believe. Uh, and also effectively reducing the loss of food from 10 to 5. So that loss of food from moles would be cut in half, and they would still lose food, just less. Right? There's, there's no... The HP isn't going up anymore? The mole HP is not going up. The, the Warren okay. HP is going up, so that you get more moles for f before the Warren disappears, and therefore when you sell the Warren and lose food, it's less food per mole that you've lost. Does that make sense? I wholeheartedly agree with this change. I think it's absolutely a step in the right direction. I mean, you could just look and see that the mole is just not prevalent in competitive one-on-one -on -one play. So, uh, you know, a buff to the mole just seems like a natural progression into the next patch. Yes, but not changing the, the kind of unit that it is where it does actually lose food. I, I like the fact that it loses efficiency if you don't get anything done with it. Um, I think that was a, an interesting solution to the problem. We're just lessening the severity of that, and I like that. 100%. On board. Awesome. All right. Moving on. Skunks. Just dropping the hit points a little bit here. Because skunks are so dominant against tier 1s, I think the idea is dropping from, 20, from 30 to 28 hit points allows skunks to be focused down a little bit more easily. Um, I, I don't think that's a huge change. And I, I will say that my ideas about balance patches is that they should be very small, especially in RTSs when it's it takes a long time to find all of the the effects that a balance patch can have. Um, going with small changes makes a lot of sense. So, what do you think of this one? Hundred percent agree. I think balance changes in RTS should be as minute as possible so that they don't really change up or shake up the game too much. And I. This is, by the way, this is great because I didn't know about any of this. Like, uh, my old patch notes that I was going to talk about are outdated. So, very cool. Everyone on stream is getting the most cutting edge uh, information here. Oh, like I, I said, I, I just got this like at 3.02, which was two minutes after this started. So, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. No, I, listen, a 2 HP to the skunk nerf. Yeah. Skunks are, are a little too strong and they're, they're used just a little more than they should be i am 100 percent in agreement i i'd like to see you know different tier twos take the spotlight as opposed to the skunk falcon which we've been seeing for so long now well so, and also just yeah not that the skunk needs to lead spotlight but how do you balance so that all of them are viable options and stylistic choices instead of one just being better right right so if you knock the skunk down a you know a quarter of a peg maybe that allows room for other tier two to just do their job i i, I like it i like this change a lot I'm, I'm on board with it as well okay snakes here buffing the snakes hit points uh four points so a little bit in the opposite direction which similar idea i think snakes are really brittle and this allows them not to become a fighting monster but just to be a little bit less touchy uh and then what is this no days uh they, they don't slow they don't slow what, 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 they slowed? They slowed, yeah. Like, if you had a snake tag on a badger, the badger wouldn't move as fast. Oh. I did not know that at all. Yeah, I, I was, like, <laughs> I was up in arms when I first heard about this. You'll, you'll, if you're still here, I know that we were talking about it. I was, I was adamantly against it because I think that the snake is, an, is a unit that offers utility. And like I said, anything that could encourage a micro is is good and anything that discourages micro is bad just as a general law of real-time strategy games and as as a utility unit you know a, a snake isn't something that you want in your death ball or even in even in a, a straight up engagement with with an opponent a, opposing army the snake isn't going to get you that much value because it does low damage slow overtime you want burst in those situations you want to be able to 
take your opponent's armies out faster than he's taking your out yours out because of, and it snowballs. So the snake is really a utility unit. And what's that utility? Well, part of it is poke, right? So the fact that I, as a player, can make a decision, I'm going to dedicate 10 seconds not to building a warren and not to scouting, but purely to, to, to microwing and poking in and out with my snake. And I'm going to get value off of that. Well, the days sort of works in tandem with that. The, the, the poke and the days sort of go hand in hand. And without this days and without this slowdown, it's sort of discouraging micro. It's sort of discouraging kiting. So at because first, you can I... punish the poke so much easier if it, if the units can chase it that much more more easily, then it discourages you from poking in the first place, right? A hundred percent, absolutely. So when I talked to Eel about it, uh, he said that well, snake is too hard of a counter to badger. And when he put it that way, you know. Even, you know, even boar, too. A boar with, with snake tags can't retreat. <laughs> and can't chase the army to explode anymore. Right. So, you know, it's tough. And this is why I think uh, Eel has one of the hardest jobs. To, to balance a real-time strategy game. On the one hand, you're giving up some utility and some poke potential. On the other hand... You're, you're allowing the prevalence of badgers and boars, which is kind of what we want in this game, right? So, yeah, and I, say, yeah. I think my impression is that overall, I like the idea of having interesting mechanics. So the fact that snakes are the only unit in the game that has a daze of effect, I think it adds more variety and it's cool. But if it's, if it's having a negative impact on the game as a whole, I get it. But what if you, instead of removing the daze, modified it because again the more variety in different units the better right which is one of the reasons i love the fact that moles lose food it's it's so unique to them right um so what if instead of the snake having no days what if the days only affected tier one units so it would instead of being so powerful against badgers and boars what if instead only was useful like for example if you're poking with a snake um, and you don't want to be chased down by the lizards because that would just discourage you from doing it in the first place. What if that daze only affected the that one lizard, or, or you know, what do you think? It would be a nerf, but it wouldn't remove the interesting effect. I also think, what if the daze only lasted one second, or as opposed to? Days... I, I, honestly, I don't know what it is right now, but I, I have a feeling it's more than a second. <laughs> right. Um, there's there yeah there's a lot of different interesting things that you can do um, but something that it's five seconds right so so you're not going to have five five second days on your badger or your boar you're going to be able to retreat but the the impact of the poke is is still there because if i poke you with my snake you can't just click your army forward and try to kill it right you know? um or maybe increase the range of the snake it's just a million things that you could do. But at the end of the day, I do understand your, your reasoning and your thought process, Eel. So yeah. uh, I'm not as against this change as I was when I first read it on paper. Yeah. Now, at the end of the day, uh, Eel sees a lot that we don't, and it's his job to try to find balance. I would just suggest, you know, instead of cutting a feature, maybe just nerf the days instead of removing it altogether. And, you know, there's got to be a lot of clever ways of nerfing the days so that it doesn't affect the things you don't want it to affect right but okay so why are here why are cutting the hit points in half from 14 to 7 but uh only taking 50 percent damage when touched so as far as how long it takes to kill it identical but it ends up being more vulnerable to attacks uh direct attacks and while it's building so wait 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 i got you gotta repeat that one this one's very technical yeah yeah sure so in effect cutting the wire's hit points for when it is taking damage directly like a, a, a ferret ball or something hitting it and when it's building but when a unit actually runs through it it's effectively the same because the unit running through it touching it is doing half the damage to the wire's half hit points um, so it looks like the goal here is to make wire more brittle while building. I see. I, so you can shut it yeah. down while it's building, but the once it's up, it's basically unchanged. 
I, I think this is a great change because this encourages you to play more active, <laughs> to have your army out on the map and to be more aggressive when you know your opponent has wire. And this also encourages the wire player to not to think about when they want to put down and use their wire because you know the wires now suddenly more vulnerable so maybe i'm waiting for a scouting rotation i see the enemy commander go back that's when i snap into place and throw my wire up the second a... the opponent sees that i have wire maybe they're going to take advantage of that and they're going to move their army to the middle of the map i think that wire is problematic in the game because of what players like meek and others are doing with triple tier three builds on one base just purely behind wire which is just insane uh, and not to mention the dominance of wire in 2v2 oh absolutely God, it is the most meta thing in 2v2 i believe although we've got some data from satoros um to talk about later about that yes yeah, so, so uh i think this is a really good change because it, it does seem like even when wire is building i'll try to run over and try to like get a few hits on it but it's very hard to to really have an impact on it while it's going up and uh i'm distracted by your totes they're absolutely hilarious <laughs> <laughs> yeah i keep collecting them at tag sales and stuff um uh, it reminds me of the mine situation where laying down mines because they take so long to build you have to do it between scouting rotations otherwise they're just caught and gone um that kind of strategy that you have to think about applied to wires is cool i, I like it yeah, and something has to be done about wire, right? So I think that uh, this is going to make players think more about when and how to use wire and mm -hmm. how to counter the wire player. So uh, I'm in favor. Yeah. I'm in favor. Yeah, and this isn't necessarily directly nerfing the effectiveness. So I like it. It's creative. Right. I think that's all of the direct things we're looking at here, and it, it sounds like the only ones we really didn't like um, or were at least on the edge about was the uh, commander timing since commander reveals basically uh, affect cams the most especially since cams are not in this list it would be a nerf to cams which are already not really that that overpowered so I, I don't know about it or maybe in tandem with this cams could use a tweak as well I, I'm not sure yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, one or two other points I want to touch on. Eel, if you're still in chat, did you redact the Q time patch? Because I know that was something that you had talked about before, faster ranked Qs. And I believe at least my interpretation, and Eel, I hope you correct me if I'm wrong, is that essentially if it takes 60 seconds to get to 14 out of 14, I think he wanted to make it so it only takes 40 seconds. But I, but I, okay toe change okay so i think eel's probably a little behind but hopefully he'll get back to us regarding the q time change yeah. that I, was at least supposed to be in the patch and then um the so, last thing that i wanted to say just really quickly go ahead um fortunately uh, we won't be seeing the outpost right so i i do want to talk about the that in a moment here um but so eel is just saying real quick he hopes the snake wire and toe changes make cams better that makes sense. So, because uh, snakes would be changed uh, like the days. Currently, you know what? With days in low numbers, it makes snakes beat cams that much more. And I love that. Uh, <laughs> personally, it's so satisfying to beat up cams with snakes. But if there is no days, it makes it a little bit tougher and more, like, skill. Uh, but also the wire and toad changes making cams a little bit better. That makes sense. So the commander yeah. reveal buff would would help to counteract that skunk too. getting a nerf is going to help chameleon yes yeah absolutely yeah yeah if skunks have to step back a little bit from the limelight cams can step up a little bit yep absolutely um okay so eel in the chat he's saying uh, we'll talk about the outpost in a moment but then also ranked reset and ranked q changes yes so so we will be entering into season five yes and so... he's trying to get that out as soon as possible so it'll wipe camel for at least for the season uh, rankings. So like we said earlier, Melvin Fro will uh, very likely take home first place for camel season four. Congrats to Melvin, very good player. And I believe everyone's rating will reset to zero. 
So, oh, wow. So That'll be some Tender chaos. will be uh, Zero alongside uh, Beak and the Gentleman and Tatanka, yeah. all fighting for supremacy. You know, it took a long time to get to 1400, like a really long time. So we'll have to see. It'll probably take at least six months until someone gets that high, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So now, uh, moving on to the experimental units. Oh, yeah, don't save. For example, I think we had four experimental units, and my favorite was the outpost. So uh, I absolutely, you know, am in favor. Don't add any new units if they're not ready, because you don't want to mess up a game that's already good, right? Um, and we're trying to get this patch out. Having said that, I hope this is not discarding the outpost for good, just delaying it for another, you know, six months, a year, whatever it is. Uh, what do you think about that, Kipo? Yeah, I, I mean, the outpost was um, a very ambitious project. And, and if you have something like the outpost, you know, like Il said, he doesn't have the data. And, and you really need to test something like that thoroughly for a long period of time and get mm -hmm. as much data from as, as many different players as possible to figure out you know how it works and how it functions and then tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak so i hope to see it and i totally understand uh you know that it's not going to be in this patch and it could potentially be in the next one. Oh yeah yeah i do not want to rush stuff like that um it's a cool idea for sure okay so we are running out of time for this uh, show today. It's getting a bit longer than I expected, but it's the first one. So we'll be putting this up on YouTube as well, um, guys. So for those of us who had to tap out, if you guys want to see the rest of it, um, that's where it'll be. I'll be posting links in the various discords. Um, we have a... I just want to um, make this a little bit shorter of a section than I think we originally intended, but just talking about 2v2 strategy, since we are right about going into the playoffs of the dual championship 2v2 is kind of at the forefront of everyone's minds um oh oh yeah by the way eel says if you're playing ranked please try the public test beta it's compatible with live but makes queuing easier okay so check out the stuff there i think all of the information will be in the discord for sure um but help eel out he's he's doing He's doing God's work. <laughs> yeah, we need to have a couple PPCs on the public test. Yeah. I think that, that would be good. And then um, maybe we could have like one or two weekends where just everyone's like, you know, we're just playing the public test. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, 2v2 strategy, just a couple of things. I know, Kipo, you had a couple of things you uh, wanted to mention. I know Satoros left us with a uh, some really cool data. He left us with a pick rate graph for which units are actually being used in 2v2s um, and then i know i have done some research on uh the mole rush the controversial i know gentlemen is in here saying that it's been banned in every other 2v2 tournament up to date and i stand by my decision to not ban it me and lupus agreed and i'll stand by that um now with the mole getting a buff we'll see but for now uh Kipo, you brought a couple of things you wanted to cover in 2v2 strategy, a couple of concepts that uh, keep coming back. So why don't you take that away? Yeah, sure. So um, we could start with the mole rush. Uh, I mean, I have some thoughts. I have some predictions uh, as to how this is going to play out. But I want to hear what you have to say about the mole rush as a viable strategy. Sure. So... Um, I did some testing with some players where we intentionally mole rushed each other over and over for a period of an hour or an hour and a half or something. I know Leon was in there. I know Cactus. Um, and, and I think it was Ben Dove was the, th the fourth. But uh, at any rate, and I've also been casting a lot. So your opinion is also, you've seen a lot of them as well, Kipo. But whenever um, a new meta appears there are super aggressive strats that people just don't know exactly know how to hold and those kind of rule for sometimes a period of months or, or years even a long time until they're held and after a while people just kind of figure out what do they need to watch out for what kind of things do they just usually need to have in their decks um to hold them and i think we're getting to the point where some folks are figuring it out um and there are a couple of strategies 
that I've learned for holding them off. But before I go to that, what what are your general thoughts? Um, My general thoughts were that it was uh, the best idea to do it in the beginning of the tournament, and it's going to be the worst idea to do it in this later stage of the tournament. I think they've been figured out. I think everyone knows that they're coming, and I think that everyone also knows the teams that use them. You're you're going up against any team that has Night Slayer on it, whether it be Night Slayer Snake (laughs) or, uh, you know, Night Slayer and Meek or Epicosti or some of these other players that love to use this strategy. And you're going to be on the lookout for it. And we saw earlier today in a replay, Satoros Leon. They shut down the Mole Rush so hard. And you didn't see the game. I suggest you go check it out. It's on my uh, Twitch channel. Uh, but they got a huge advantage after they shut that Mole Rush down. So I, I think that, like I said, when the tournament first started, go for it. It's probably going to work. Now that we're in this later stage and we've seen so much of what this Mole Rush can do, it's going to be shut down at, at every point, and I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see a team go for it. Sure. Okay, so having said that, what are some of the strategies for... Um, what are some of the strategies for holding a 2v2? Or, sorry, uh, in a 2v2, what are some of the strategies for holding the double mole rush? And to be clear, what we're talking about is a four-farm double from both players where... Each player has four farms, and they put down two Mulwarns right up against one of the opponent's bases. And right as the first four moles pop out, they target a mill and just kill the mill straight up, and suddenly it's a 2v1. That's what we're talking about. Um, There are a couple of factors that make it stronger. When the defending team is split, it makes it so much harder to hold, but not impossible. Um, If there is high ground where you can hide the moles, where they're closer, um, you know, that makes it better. What are the ways you can hold it? First thing, you have to see it coming. And by see it coming, I don't mean you have to see the the mole warrants, because if you see the mole warrants, it might be too late. It's not necessarily, but it might be too late. What you need to watch for is watch for your opponents selling their farms. Clear so far? If you're watching your opponent's base and they all of a sudden sell down to four farms and you don't see their their warrens for like a regular four farm double lizard rush or something, it's moles, absolutely. Um, so you, you go home and you prepare for it. That's the first thing. And in order to do that, relay scouting is so, so critically important because in a 2v2, if you relay scout properly, there is not a moment more than maybe a second long when you do not have your eyes on your opponent's base. Um, and so that is really a strategy that has to be if you want to consistently hold mole rushes you have to be really scouting and see when they sell the farms watch for the warrens if you don't see the warrens at home it's moles you can go home and it's you can be ready for it quicker than they actually put the mole warrens down um so that's the first thing is see it coming the thing the second thing is lizards are the best tier one to hold a mole rush um lizards are technically melee units but they have a range enough to kite and you don't have to crush the moles you can just hold them and you're ahead so using lizards is usually the best thing because they can get to the scene of the crime quicker than squirrels Um, you also don't want to put your warrens out where the moles can hit them but again what we're talking about is generally what moles going for the kill right on the mill so relay scouting lizards the next thing is wire you don't usually think of wire countering moles but in this case it's incredibly useful because it just slows down the moles that little extra bit it gives you maybe a half a second longer to get that those lizards out um and if your team is split the team that's being targeted can worry about getting their lizards up immediately and the other player can go over and support with wire uh turrets i've some people are saying that turrets are also useful i haven't tested that as much but that's another thing that's true. Like a man's saying in the chat here, with the patch, not so sure about the wire. Yes, this is this current patch, so we'll have to see um, as it moves on. For But for right now, lizards, wire, uh, you want to put the lizard warrens down first, and then the wire. Um, and that's... You, you'll be able to hold a mole rush almost every time with those kinds of things. Um, what are you thinking about that, Kipo? I think that was an that was a really uh, detailed rundown. Uh, I, I I 
completely agree with everything that you said. You know, there's no reason for why you should be on the same scouting rotation as your ally. You go in, and then I go in. I'm watching for moles. Uh, you put if you're gonna do a five farm single or a four farm double, put your warrants behind your mill. Make sure they're safe so that the moles can't t target them down. Wire can be a pretty good distraction. And if you and your ally are far apart from one another, and this is something that's important that I don't see too many teams do. Mm -hmm. If you're running Squizzard, you are going to build lizards. Because if if you're far apart from your ally and you have squirrels, they're not going to get over there in time. They're yeah. not going to be able to help out on the defense. So it's better to just run lizards and and just watch for it make sure you're not caught off guard and for five farm single i mean i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fault you for going a five farm single or you know in, in today's day and age uh we have a comment here from eel with the change to wires that is being proposed moles basically would one hit destroy wire so let me be clear about the purpose of wire in stopping a mole rush it is not actually to get the wire up and have it finished and deny the moles this, the uh, access to the mill. It's actually just wires half finished in the process of building in that vulnerable state are actually helpful in surviving a mole rush because it gives the mole something to hit before it gets to the mill. Um, and it makes it that much harder for the mole players to micro and, and target down the mill because the moles stop, hit the wire, then keep moving. And that split second does actually make a difference in my in my experience so you don't actually have to get the the wire up completely but uh also eel saying that the five second mine would probably be better yeah i when this new patch comes out with mines or yeah with mines being built quicker could very well be helpful i i like that yeah and it gives your pigs an extra hit uh, on the mole because yeah. the, the mole is distracted with the, with the wire. So yeah, uh, maybe maybe a, maybe a mole goes down. It doesn't get two shots off on the mill. It only gets one, and maybe that's the whole game. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. The other things to mention, real quick, uh, kind of a peripheral thing is when you beat the mole rush, counterattack immediately. Like immediately, if you have lizards and they just sold their mole warrants, go kill them. You've got a free game. Do it. The only way they can hold from that is building turrets, and you can walk around those. So depending on the map, if you've held the mole rush, you get the game for free, which is probably why, like Kipo said, we're not going to see the mole rush anymore uh, at high levels. Absolutely. So what is the uh, what is the next concept in the 2v2? Sure. So, you know, like you said, I am going to be brief. I don't want to take up too much time because we are sort of running out. So yep. I'll just bring up one strategy. Okay. And I, I think that this strategy is underutilized and is extremely strong maybe i'll be i'll be proved wrong i want to hear your thoughts tandor oh wow wait a second we got the uh the pick rates up uh go ahead with this strat i'm curious i'll i'll bring that up in a second here it, it's just a four farm double liz rush so basically if if your opponents are disconnected they're not right next to each other that even if there's a little bit of room in between them and you four farm double liz rush both of you Mm -hmm. and, and and you scout this guy has the squirrels and you go for the other guy right you, you make it ambiguous you run around with the lizards maybe you make it look like you're going for the squirrel player but then you shift over to the player that has lizards on the other side yeah. the reason you do that is because those squirrels are going to take so long to walk over to their allies base and then you have a two on one even if it's a two on one for five seconds that's that you're still going to get a pick or two and you could just snowball from there I, I really think that this four farm double liz rush is overpowered in two versus two and underutilized but i want to hear what you think master of nonsense says keep a why would you encourage this is this the world you want to live in i'm gonna no, say it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it works though right i'm gonna say as my response that what you're doing is not trying to get free wins off of bad match and what you're doing is punishing squirrel play so yep. the result is not anytime the opponents are split you win the result is people stop going squirrels early on and we just have a, a different game early on so i agree i think it's incredibly powerful to punish the squirrel play like that because in 2v2s one of the most critical elements is the 2v1 if you can find yourself in a 2v1 awesome we've seen that um, in some of our examples today. So 
Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Get the lizards out, watch for the squirrels, and once you see them, you know you can go for the other guy and the squirrels won't be there in time. Right, and you can mind game it. You you can yeah. you can make it look like you're going for the squirrel player, and then at the last second, sprint to the Liz Boy's base. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you just get one or two farms, or a warren and a farm, or you wipe his army, you're getting tempo, and you could use that to just continuous you know continuously have a bigger army. You could get your economy going, and you could just be ahead. So, now I, uh, I want to see a counter to this where one person goes squirrels anyway, and the other one uses toads but doesn't show the toads until they're being attacked uh, i can see some really interesting uh, counterplay from that but you know oh, yeah. toads don't necessarily counter lizards if the lizards are split and if it's a 2v1 the lizards are split so right all right well that little uh, nugget being thrown out there and you've created a little bit more hell for some people thank you for that keep <laughs> <laughs> let's look at this uh graph here oh let me not this uh sitaros uh Pulled this data out. He went through. He, he, he said he created a script to uh, look at the replays from the 2v2 championship. So cool. Let me zoom I I out a little that. bit. I know. I don't know what. I don't know how he did it, but right here. So, if you guys want to go say thanks to Satoros, this is what we're looking at. Squirrels. Uh, oh, let me explain the numbers real quick. This is percentages on the left side. Uh, so, what percentage of games they're picked in or something like that so more than half the time we're seeing squirrels and lizards and skunks right um, and actually eel you might be interested in this this is just for 2v2s bear that in mind but uh check it out what is one of the what are some of the things that are standing out to you in this keepa the wolf being the number one tier three i i honestly didn't see that coming and and i yeah i can anyone in chat? I mean, I mean, how is Wolf the number one tier? Th I get Owl being right there, right? Right. And then, and then I get Fox being at the other end because I, I don't really know that Fox has a, a place in two versus two. Um, but the Wolf is something that is surprising me. How, what do you take away from that? Oh, I I have a lot to say about this. I've been I've been saying for about a week now very strongly that Wolf is easily the strongest tier three in 2v2s not in 1v1s and let me uh let me say it this way the wolf has the ability to strengthen any other unit almost any other unit um if, like at a large level so it, it just like how micro can give a lot of extra value to a unit the wolf gives a lot of extra value to every other unit um and gives more micro possibilities, like a wolf fox. The only way fox is viable in 2v2, I think, is with a wolf, because it gives it a little extra speed to get away from sticky situations, shoot faster, etc. Um, and it's not just wolf owl. In fact, wolf owl in 2v2s is kind of rough, because it's that much harder to get the wolf to buff the owl. Um, right. But here's why wolf is not that good in 1v1s. You only have six deck slots, right? So... If the wolf takes one of those deck slots, you only have five other things that are even potentially buffable. Uh, we see wolf owl in 1v1s because they're such a good pair. Uh, we see triple tier three and the like, but I think one of the reasons wolf is so good in 2v2 is because you have so many more deck slots at your disposal so that you're not crippling yourself by cutting out one of your six. You're just using one of your 12 deck slots and you get such power out of it. I think that's a pretty sound reasoning. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And Lego Man pointed out in chat earlier, you know, I don't really see that much of a difference between the wolf and the owl on the graph. And when I look at it really closely, I, I, I'm inclined to agree. They look pretty similar, and they are a natural pairing as well. So, yeah. What other interesting takeaways do you have, Tandor? Um, I want to say that the snake being right up there, uh, right behind the skunk, is not that surprising um in fact i've seen a kind of a burgeoning snake uh snake pigeon squirrel snake pigeon or lizard snake pigeon but i think squirrel snake pigeon is is a thing and it's terrifying especially in 2v2s because the snake pigeon player can poke so effectively back up and heal and the pigeons are all also healing your ally if he's around so that's a thing that I, i've seen that i hadn't seen before in 1v1s a whole lot um also we're seeing comments in the chat about squirrels only being at 65, expecting them to be higher. And I think I know why, because lizards are so powerful in 
2v2s because you need to be able to get your ally, a lot of teams are going Squizzard on one player and Lizard Toad on the other. And just foregoing Squirrels altogether, not as cheese, but as standard. You can go Lizard Toad in 2v2s and it's fine. Uh, what is your take on that? The fact that Squirrels are not higher. <laughs> I don't know. I I didn't. I didn't think. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, a lot of players run Squirrel Lizard and Squirrel Toad, so the fact that they're in more than sixty percent of the games makes sense to me. I mean, I knew they would be the number one. On the right. Graph, and that doesn't surprise me at all. Honestly, I uh, thought Lizard was going to be the number one. I if I had to write this list, I would have swapped Lizard and Squirrel as a guess. Cause, and it makes yeah. yeah. I'm a proponent of the squirrel lizard lizard toad, the ha one player not having squirrel at all, just ever. I, I, that's me. I I like to be the lizard toad player in a two v two only. I'm not that in a one v one. So Interesting. yeah. Um, we uh, also we also thought ferrets were going to be a lot better in two v twos. They're a lot lower than I expected. Um, they are. I thought they'd be higher. That's right. I I agree. I feel like I see them all the time, but I guess they're maybe just the games that I cast. Sure. And then uh, Wire and Mines. Wire is way up there. Wire is, like, one of the most meta things, and I think it's not higher than that, only because generally teams only need one of the players to have it. So your standard right. 2v2 decks is one of the players always goes Mines, because there's, or sorry, Wire, because it's so helpful. Uh, but Mines, the forgotten boy down there. They're impossible to get up. I, I mean, you put down a mine, and there's just so much scouting happening in these 2v2 games. That they're just bound to be found. I have seen them used to counter lizards, and I would expect them to be a bit higher uh, because of the prevalence of A, lizards, and B, the lizard, how the lizards are used specifically with their run-bys. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, wire is just a little more versatile, and uh, I guess people just think it's it, it does the same role as, as a mine, but a wire is just a, a, has a little better value on it. So I get that. That makes sense to me. The uh, very last observation I have is that Badger and Boar are tied. Uh, Badger may be having a slight edge, but it looks like they're tied. 1v1s, I think Boars are way better than Badgers, or at least way more used. They're easier to use. But in 2v2s, we've seen some killer Badger plays and Wolf Badger. Oh my goodness, don't even get me started. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is really cool that this is up and, uh, you know, I encourage folks to go back into the video and just, you know, maybe, maybe have some more discussions based on this data. I, I think it's really cool that Satoros did this and uh, I, I, I would have thought Boar would be higher because you have so much mass tier one everywhere. I've seen a lot of games where, where Boars will just come in and then they'll just, they'll just end the game right there. So uh, really interesting, really cool stuff. Yeah, so in the chat, Master of Nonsense saying um, if he could make a global unit pick with a win percentage graph, that'd be really interesting. He actually mentioned that earlier and something he really wanted to do, but that it was an extra layer for the uh, for the thing he was coding to do this, I guess. So I think he wants to do it and he's working on it. So um, we'll bring that to a future episode of this show if, uh, if he gets that done. And speaking of... This is going to be all the content we've got for you guys. It's kind of a mammoth episode. Uh, we're going to try to cut down a little bit for future ones, limited to like hour and a half instead of two and 15. Um, but I hope you all enjoyed. Um, we're also, you know, I, I may be inviting other co-hosts on as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and for now, I want this to be a weekly uh, show. I was, I was trying to debate with myself between weekly and bi-weekly. But I like the idea of weekly because it allows us to keep up to date with Pocketbot Cup and other things. Um, so any final words, Kipo? Very cool. Yeah, just thanks for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. And um, it's really cool to just sit down and, and talk about all that's going on because there's there really is a lot happening in Tooth and Tail, even though we are a super small community, we're super active. So I really enjoyed myself and uh, had fun talking about Tooth and Tail with you. Yeah. All right. And right up till now, we'll have this in the YouTube. So thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, you know, all that stuff. And I'll see you guys later.